Welcome to Low Country Snapshots. I'm your host, Courtney Guthrie, and today I'm looking into the history of Sun City through the eyes of somebody who was here from nearly the very beginning. How has it changed over the time and what is new about it? Maybe what even might be coming in the future? This is Holly Field and she's going to give us her insights. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I'm pleased to be here. So when did you move into Sun City? Well, we bought in, let's see, it was 95, uh, closed on the house in April of 96, but didn't move in until September of 97 because I was still working. So we would come down from time to time. So we had the house from 96 on. So what made you interested in moving here? We were looking around. I was trying to keep my husband from wanting to move anywhere. I liked it where I was in the Chicago area. And the kids were there and everything else. But uh, we looked all over. We looked in many different places in the country. And we were on our way uh, down south and just stopped by this area. And both of us decided that this was a really good place and a good opportunity. What made you think that? Well, there's something, someone said to me, Getting in on the start will be interesting because you'll meet new people, you'll all be in the same boat, it's a great opportunity, and Del Webb had a good reputation in other parts of the country. Okay, so you drive in and what's the thing that you saw that you said, this is it, this is the place for us? Uh, it was gradual, I think, just hearing what was going to be here, and this was their first community outside of kind of the Dallas area and uh, not Dallas, I mean uh, outside of Arizona area. And um, so it was, it was an opportunity maybe to have something different. We'd been to Hilton Head several times. As a matter of fact, I came to Hilton Head in 57 with my parents. So I saw Hilton Head when there wasn't much Hilton Head. Um, and so I knew the area and really liked it. And we looked at other communities around here and this just seemed to be something that would develop into a, a fun place to be. So, so, wait, you, so you visited Hilton Head from childhood. How often did you come and visit? Oh, not, not often, just uh, maybe a couple more times. But I knew the area. I knew that it was a charming here to be on the water. Chicago has a lake, a very big lake, but the, the ocean is very attractive too. So. Had you already registered some changes like from your memories of childhood and seen how it's grown up oh, since then? Well, of course, the biggest growth has been since we moved in. I mean, it, uh, yes, of course, it was very different. When the first time that I was here, there was one hotel on the island. They were um, selling. That was how they got people to come and they were selling lots. And we happened to be here the week that they sold their first oceanfront property for $10,000. And the salesmen were all celebrating. Nobody would pay that much money. And it was just amazing. So I really saw it when it was not much there. There was Bluffton. And I have a cookbook from that era from the church in Bluffton. Wow, so I imagine it would be interesting to look at how the recipes have changed as well. <laughs> well, they, they have low country boil in there, they have shrimp salads in there. Well, that hasn't changed. No, it hasn't. So. so you come to Sun City and you hear what's going to be here and it, and it interests you. What was anything that stood out as something special that made you say, we've got to, we've got to click it? Well, I think part of it was the location. Part of it was also, we'd just been to um, Kentucky and in the rolling country. And there we stayed in a, a piece of property that was in, it wasn't really blocks, but it was like you had to go up a hill and then down a hill from the house. And it just seemed like this would be a really easy place to get around and just have a, a comfortable community of walking and uh, golf carts. So they gave you the expectation that there would be a lot of walking here. Did you know about the, the golf courses and the pools and all that? Well, I knew that there were going to be golf courses. And as a matter of fact, Del Webb always built the amenities first. So uh, the swimming pool was here. The, the uh, town center was here. Uh, over the years, they changed tremendously what they were going to put on town center. But uh, we knew that that was all coming. 
so. Okay, so you make the decision and you buy a property. Right. What number were you? 166. Oh darn, why is that <laughs> significant? Well, it was, uh, it was part of the old CAM number. So uh, you always knew uh, when you had moved in according to your CAM number, because that was, it was 10166 was our number that was the beginning of it. So anyway, it was made it very easy to know that, but we missed the first hundred which were the considered the founders. So we weren't quite in that first barrel landing club. Darn. <laughs> so you move in and what does life become like? Well, at first, well, uh, the, a couple of things. We had been down before we moved in, so we'd stayed for a weekend and that kind of thing. So the day the moving van arrived, I had already played tennis uh, and the captain of the team there was only one tennis team back then. Captain of the team showed up at my doorstep while the moving van was still unloading and said, practice is Thursday, your partner is Lee, we'll see ya. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on the tennis team from the very beginning. That's great, yes. so very outgoing people. Yes. Uh, the first time I came to Sun City, I got stopped at the gate and I did not have a pass called in for me and we were we bought a house here, we, how do we get in? What were the interests like for you when you first started at Sun City? Well, there, 278 didn't exist. The only way to get here was 170, either coming down from Buford or up from uh, Hardyville, I guess. Uh, and you had to go through um, Bluffton. And Bluffton at that point was one square mile. And their biggest income was a speed trap. They stopped everybody going to Hilton Head on these little side roads. So actually we came down, but in coming down, the, the one day we came down that way, they were burning the side of the roads. And that was how they got rid of all the grass. They didn't mow it, they just burned. And all of a sudden, here was this cloud of smoke that you had to drive through on 170, and you couldn't see, you didn't know where the road was, it was just, they did stop the burning. I'm really glad about that. That is, okay, so what was the landscaping like other than burning stuff? Oh, well, it was, it was, there were just a lot of trees. I mean, there still are, but not as many as there were. The road to Savannah, there was a spot on that one that, and you had to go to Savannah for everything. We had no Home Depot. We had no, we barely had the Piggly Wiggly in Bluffton was the only grocery store around here. So you were always driving places. And um, there was a stretch on that road to Bluffton that reminded me of the one outside of Williamsburg. It was all the oak trees that were a canopy over the road. And then when they put the circle in down on 170, they moved the road over so you no longer go through that patch of land that was just absolutely gorgeous. Um, so we talked a little bit about the community and how someone was at your door from the second you pulled in. How is community like in general at that time? I think you were telling me something earlier about off camera about the doctors and the dinners that, that they had. Oh, oh yes. Well, everybody wanted to welcome all the people in Sun City. So everybody gave dinners and to, doctors would have dinners for you so that you could um, hear their spiel, learn to meet them, and then become, and you can see that now in that we have doctors from Savannah and Buford and everywhere, They're, they have now come to us, but at that time you had to go to them. So you were driving either on the island or to Buford or to Savannah to go to, to doctors. But the, so they had all of these elaborate, and it was not just the doctors, it was investment people, it was, and the, you still get cards for that around here. True. I do. Um, I'm interested in knowing um, about the community involvement in certain activities. You had talked a little bit about there was more community involvement um, and now that's kind of handled by management or something? There aren't as many people, I think, volunteering now. And in the very beginning, there was nothing here. So anything like the clubs, it was somebody that started it. And there may be a new club now and then, but I mean, we started with no clubs. Those were all, all driven by 
the residents. I even started Book Club too. Didn't stay in it very long, but it's still going with just other people. So things got started and then got continued. The, the tennis grew tremendously, obviously. Now there are so many different tennis teams and uh, everything has just grown as more people have moved in and certain things have become more popular than others. Um, but we did, we were able to do more of being or creating what the community was going to be. There were no neighborhood reps when we started. That was something that was started by residents. And actually, most of the first neighborhood reps came off my street right here uh, for our community. But uh, we are, Historic Village is the oldest of all of the neighborhoods. So that, you know, maybe makes sense. But the television was started by people here. And it used to be, I don't know if you've ever looked at where uh, it used to be. But if you go through the kitchen and uh, out the side door, there are stairs. Have you ever been up there? No, ma'am. Well, that's where the TV studio used to be. And the stairs were like it's very steep. And there was one little room and then another one and a window in between, and that's where all the filming was. Oh, wow. I had no idea. <laughs> and here I am a part of it. <laughs> so what else were you involved in starting? You said the book club. Anything else? Um, well, I started staying connected much later on, and that's still going. And that was, I started that. I was a neighborhood rep, and a couple of uh, gals in my neighborhood came to me and said, there's something like this out there, and I think we ought to do it. So we tried it first in our neighborhood. And we realized it needed to have a broader base. And so went to the board with uh, four other people, wrote a letter to the board, and they started a committee. And uh, we had 10 people then that for a year and a half worked on how we were going to form it and what was going to happen. And, so, and that was several years before we opened the door and, and uh, got going on it. So, yeah. Well, thanks for all you did with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's, you know, at, back then I had to serve on a tennis board at some point. I had to, I mean, you know, there were lots of opportunities, but there were also, if you wanted something, you had to make it happen. I see. So um, now looking back at it and seeing what has changed, what would you say are the biggest and best changes you've seen over the years? Oh, I think it's continued involvement by the people. The people are what make it what it is. I see changes in entertainment. Um, I can now hear what's going on in the town hall for entertainment, and I've never had anything, we never had music that, that was outside and that loud before. So I can now hear it all the way at my house. So there's more entertainment than there used to be. There were little things, but we didn't have very many people. So now it's, it's big concerts and so, programs. So the movie theater and all that, was that here when you? Oh, as a matter of fact, that was the other thing. I was very involved in, um, in the magazine, in Sensations. As a matter of fact, there were three of us that started writing an alternate mid-month stories because it, uh, Sensations was just an activity brochure. So they allowed us to publish and distribute it, and then it got incorporated as part of, of Sensations. So before, Sensations didn't have the articles and the stories that it had in it. And so that was kind of a, a something that grew, too, and, and changed. And it was all um, resident run. We had a writing committee. We wrote, we decided what to put in it. We wrote all the stories, uh, all the articles, and we always said if you could read about it anywhere else, it wasn't going to be in Sensations because it was by and about. Um, and so the whole thing was, I, there was one man who was the editor, and he put together all of the, the, the copy to make the magazine. Um, I was in charge of the committee, and we had about 10, 15 people that did all of the writing. We had no other employees at all. That's fantastic that you got so much done, though. I mean, a tribute to you. Oh, no, 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 no. No, that was it. We were a committee of 10, and uh, 
So, and they, I still talk to the people that were on that committee and they loved when we were doing that. So that's something that has changed from being community run to being um, staff run now. And having seen all of this, where do you see it going in the future? Do you like the direction it's taking? Oh, you know, it, things change so much with the size. Who knew that they were going to buy additional land and just keep growing? So you can't, and then they, they developed, there's Argent 1, 2, and 3. We're Argent 1, and that was the first one developed. But then they developed Argent 3 and waited to, to do the one across 278. And um, that by then, Hardyville had gotten there and Jasper County. So being in a different county has changed things too. And then the bridge that goes across 278, we used to call that the bridge to nowhere. And that was because there was nothing on that side. They still had trees. And the, so, but it had to be built because there was money involved from the state. And if, uh, if Pulte didn't do their share and get it built, then they would lose that state money. So they built it even before there was a need for it. And yet, now we have a great restaurant there and, right. and great living over there. Um, speaking of the restaurants, you had talked a little bit to me before about the restaurants. What do you like and, and, what, do you, and what do you want out of the restaurants? Oh. Well, that was, that was early on. That was kind of interesting because we only had the one. And it was privately run. Well, and, but they, well anyway, it was, it was run through the community. But... Um, they used to have us over and talk to us and interview and find out what we wanted to have on the menu, and they geared their menu to us. Uh, when it started, however, I'm a, a huge fan of chicken salad. I, I eat that wherever, and I judge restaurants by how good their chicken salad is. And the first one was kind of mashed salad, and I felt that the young chef was thinking we were an old people's home and making it accordingly. Oh, uh, well, you straighten about? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no. I, I think he just didn't sell much of it. <laughs> well, um, now we know that you're, you're going to leave us. What was involved in the decision there? That was from the very beginning that I, I always said, there comes a time when you need to be close to family. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm moving close. When I came here, um, and my husband and I came in. He was only here for about s the first six years. I've stayed on uh, for the, I've been here 25 now, but um, he passed away after six years. But my mother wouldn't come down here with us. She was, wanted to stay where her friends were. And I found it that it was hard taking care of her up there when I was living so far away. And so I just kind of said, well, when I'm 80, I will move back close to my kids so they don't have to worry about that. And so the time has come for me to leave. So talking a little bit more about the community involvement, yes. tell me about a little more about the theater and how that transitioned over time. Well, ag well, again, the whole theater came because there were people here who really wanted to be a part of it. And uh, they just kind of created it. And initially they were in Pinckney and the stage there was just, you know, the floor was flat, the stage was small, and they were very limited. They used to build wings on the side when they put their, their uh, sceneries up so that they could change, but it was not desirable to, to watch it. If you were more than four rows back, you could barely see, particularly as short as I am, you could barely see what was going on. So they really pushed to get a magnolia, and the idea was it would be not just for the theater group. And of course, the chorus group by that time had formed already, and they were singing, and they had a director that, that was really building that. And so they really went to the community and said, this is what we would like to do here. And as most places, they had pl other different plans for there but they decided to modify it and have the theater. And of course, what preceded things on that land was the softball diamond. And that's the location of the softball diamond. So then that had to get moved out to another area in order to uh, 
have the land for, for that. But it showed the amount that the community itself could change the focus of what happened. And the softball diamond too, those guys really took it over and kind of built that themselves and got sponsors for it and they maintained it and all sorts of things. So there's been a lot during the time of building by having the community involvement. So it sounds like it was really strong community and that also bled into the woodworkers. And that was another big group that, uh, oh my goodness, that has been so popular in the community. I, over the years I've talked to a lot of people considering living here and the woodworkers was unique and something that really attracted them. And again, they outgrew what they had and so they were responsible for for making it what it is today and really getting in there and volunteering and raising funds and doing all sorts of things to, to build up to make it what it is. That's amazing. So you mentioned that the only entrance is on 170 and you also kind of mentioned before 270 or 278. How, when did that come about and what kind of changes came about that? Well, that was a big deal, and I don't remember the year that it finally came in, but as I said, the bridge to nowhere uh, existed before there was a road underneath it to go somewhere. And so um, Hilton Head was still getting traffic either from the north or south until that was built. So I, th I think that may have been in the plans, but the traffic was nowhere near what it is now. and. Uh, 278 made a huge difference in the development of the area around us, not just us. Uh, but then the, the gate changed to being on 278. They had the road going in across the way, uh, but there was nothing on that side. And of course, then Riverbend was actually built before the land across the, the way. And so there was one road that went from the bridge winding around over there and then to Riverbend. So Riverbend people could uh, access our property by crossing uh, and then coming across through it and coming across uh, on 278. But the years, and I think it took over a year for them to actually pave that road because that road was just a dirt road. And if they wanted to play golf in their own cart, that was the way Riverbend people came. So then uh, when they paved it, they shut it down. So then Riverbend had to drive over to the golf to play because there was no road anymore for them oh, no. to take. <laughs> they needed their golf cart. That's right. And then the traffic on 278 just gradually increased. And as things grew here and we had other places to shop, and when Home Depot came in, of course, that was a huge deal because having to drive all the time down uh, to Savannah to get blinds, because when you move in a new house, you have nothing. Nothing's there at all. So it, it has grown around us as much as Sun City has grown. The territory has changed so much. And the, before they put in the new widening of 278, it was just two lanes. And Friday night, you didn't go anywhere. You didn't go out to eat. You didn't go anywhere because you couldn't get out on that road. So how did it shift the, the focus of this area being Hilton Head more towards Bluffton in this area? Was it all Sun City? It, well, that was a big beginning of it. It really was. Um, I, but I think that that just drew more people or more attention to the area. And then all of a sudden, other developers were getting the idea. And I always heard that the one that did the Crescent would follow Del Webb wherever he was, and they would build another community because they knew Del Webb would be successful, and so therefore they would be successful. So it just kind of kept spawning other communities and other neighborhoods because uh, that we were here. And, and we, as we grew, the grocery stores came and uh, the other services came that were never here before. So, And now remodeling. I mean, my goodness, and when we had new houses at the beginning, who needed to remodel? Now we've got all these companies that'll come in and remodel your kitchen and 
everything else. So it's, uh, it, this has grown, and a big part of it was having Sun City be here. Now, they did think that all that property, they told us when we bought, that all that property, which is now being developed where Walgreens is, and that strip of land across there, um, that, they thought that would be where all the stores came. And for some reason, eventually, Food Lion did come. And, but that, the way they envisioned it developing was not quite what came. Hmm. Well, I know that they're going to be losing a great source here in Sun City. And I really appreciate your time to talk about the history. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, that's been fun.